Our natural resources have been the foundation for America's rise to world leadership. Since our continued leadership depends on these resources, we ought to consider how we are using this natural wealth. Consider whether we are wasting it or using it wisely. To understand what is happening, let's think back for a moment. In the early days, forests that seemed inexhaustible greeted the Midwestern pioneer. Their covered wagons rolled over endless, unbroken prairies. Pure, clear waterways patterned the landscape. Between the days of those covered wagon trails and our present superhighways, we have made enormous mechanical advances. We have built a great nation. But what about our natural resources? We are finding now that the forests were not inexhaustible. Many of the prairies and rolling hills are badly eroded, their topsoil washed away. And many of the clear lakes and streams have been polluted with factory waste and city sewage. We have drawn heavily on these resources, and because they were abundant, we gave little thought to conserving their usefulness. We cut madly at our forests, and today we are trying to replace them through reforestation. We plowed deeply in fertile fields, the harvests were heavy, but today we must adopt soil conservation practices such as strip cropping and contour farming to rebuild depleted soils. Thus, in our use of forests and soils, we are trying to correct what we recognize now as mistakes of the past. In handling our water resources, we already recognize some of our mistakes. But we are still making decisions about the use of surface waters. In light of past experience with other resources, it seems wise to re-examine the value of these surface waters before too many disappear. Just what are we doing with our surface waters? We are damming hundreds of water courses. We're digging miles of diversion ditches. And draining thousands of ponds and marshes in an effort to make the land more usable. The drainage program has been extensive, its effect far reaching. In 70 years, we have drained 90 million acres of wet land. That's more than a million acres each year. It is true that a great deal of the drainage in highly productive land is good agricultural practice. Here, the crop values probably outweigh other marsh uses. But in less productive areas, drainage may not be desirable. Many people differ with the landowner who refers to his marsh as a worthless mud hole. Actually, a marsh means different things to different people. Let's consider the viewpoint of persons who see positive values in our marshlands. The flood relief worker knows that marshes have value in the control of floods. 
flood control is still an unsolved problem. Some hope of relief from occasional widespread floods may lie in large river basin dams. But we need more than dams. Marshes play an important role in storing waters. There are thousands of small ponds and marshes in many regions. Marshes which normally catch and store tremendous quantities of meltwaters in spring or runoff after heavy rains. The reserve capacity of these marshes can reduce flood crests and help prevent disastrous local floods. The geologist studying the relationship between land and water would not advise draining many of our marshes. He knows the marsh is often a valuable source of water for wells. Surface waters seep down into underground layers. The porous rock layers may carry this water many miles to supply distant wells. Thus, the marshes contribute to the basic surface water supply, without which many wells would become dry. Sometimes a landowner, trying to drain the marsh he considers a worthless mud hole, finds his drainage efforts are unsuccessful. Poorly ditched marshlands invite fires, especially in late fall and early spring, when the vegetation is dry. These fires, which begin in a partly dried marsh, often destroy farm buildings and homes. Sometimes they even ignite peat beds, which smolder and smoke for months, even years. To the farm boy interested in trapping, a marsh producing muskrats means extra pocket money. But the wild fur pelts taken yearly from our marshes bring in more than pocket money. In 1949, the wild furs taken in Minnesota alone were valued at over two and one half million dollars. Trapping is still an important activity it did not disappear with the pioneer. In addition to muskrats, the marshes produce highly valued meat. The fur industry, which provides employment for hundreds of trappers, fur buyers, tanners, and furriers, depends largely on animals which live in these threatened marshes. And two million sportsmen have made waterfowl hunting a billion dollar activity. These sportsmen know that even the small farmland marshes provide breeding grounds for ducks and are therefore indispensable in maintaining our waterfowl population. Today, we must also give growing consideration to the tens of thousands of men and women, boys and girls, making a nationwide recreation of observing and studying the out of doors. Imagine their enjoyment as they watch the home life of a pied-billed grebe family.
Energetic bird watchers may wear hip boots. Some even use water skis in traveling through less accessible parts of a marsh. Here, hidden from most eyes, are birds like the least bittern. A least bittern sitting motionless with its bill in the air can scarcely be distinguished from the cattails. Even a less active bird watcher, observing from his auto, can become familiar with marsh birds like the black tern. Sometimes the bird watcher may even get a glimpse of a rare species like this long-billed dowager. All you need for these ringside views of marsh wildlife is a pair of binoculars and, of course, a marsh. We have seen that a marsh means different things to different people. The farmer may think his marsh is wasted land unless he can drain it to gain more ground for crops. On the other hand, a flood relief worker wants to retain marshes because they help prevent local floods. A geologist knows that marshes are often valuable in maintaining underground water supplies. A fire warden sees the poorly drained marsh as a dangerous fire hazard. The farm boy and trapper benefit from the marsh because it produces fur-bearing mammals. The waterfowl hunter depends on marshes to provide game birds for his sport. And the nature hobbyist gains deep satisfaction from observing and studying marsh wildlife. Yet the big question remains, how can we make the best use of our ponds and marshes? Should we drain them or maintain them? Many landowners are at the point of making this decision. Will the many different values of a marshland be given consideration when these decisions are made? Or will the short-sighted mistakes that were made with soils and forests be repeated here? If this were your marshland, how would you use it?